Good evening, Prime Minister. Uh, my name is David from Darlington. Uh, my question is very simple. Since the 2019 election, when the Conservative Party won an 80-seat majority, do you believe that the Conservative Party have delivered anything of real substance and value since then? Perfect. David, well, great to hear from you. I was in Darlington earlier today, working out of the campus that I set up there when I was Chancellor, um, which is a great example, actually, of levelling up. And you're asking, what have we delivered over the past few years? You know, you don't have to look much further than Teesside, actually, to see what we're delivering for people. So, what, what the Freeport? The, all of the Freeport shenanigans that was definitely 100% not corrupt, absolutely not. No corruption here whatsoever, absolutely clean hands entirely. On top of levelling up as a plan which barely gave out any money at all. You know, great in principle, absolute failure in practice. Now, that is an area that had been neglected by the Labour Party for decades. And if you look at what's happened over the last few years, we've got a great Conservative mayor and Ben Houchin is doing a fantastic job. We've taken advantage of... Yes, they're definitely not corrupt, Mayor. Exit <laughs> ...to create a brand new freeport in Teesside. And what's a freeport? It's something that we couldn't properly do inside the European Union. Outside of it, we've created them. It attracts businesses with tax incentives. And businesses are investing in Teesside, creating jobs in the industries of the future. I put the Treasury campus in Darlington. Just think about that for a second. In Darlington, mm. right? Put, forget about not it being in London. Forget about putting it in the north. That's not something to be proud of. That should be normal. It should be normal that every part of the country gets some amount of funding. Like the fact, after 14 years, you're coming down here to us, or coming or going up there, I guess, into the northeast and going, look at me. Isn't it amazing how I did something in the northeast? I mean, it is amazing, but only amazing in comparison to 45 years of industrial decline. This should be normal. You, know, you shouldn't be getting praise for doing what you should be fucking doing. Or if it's not in one of the big northern cities, not in Manchester, Leeds or Newcastle, it's in Darlington. Because it's places like Darlington that are now getting the focus from a Conservative government. You can see it in the infrastructure improvements that are happening. Darlington Station being upgraded. The high streets and town centres in Stockton and Thornaby. Not so far from here. Spending more, all of these places getting record amounts of investment. Blythe, new railway line. So look, those are the changes that are happening. That is the plan that is working. And what is it about? It's about spreading opportunity, because that's what I care about. It's about making sure that wherever you live in our country, you can grow up and know that your dreams can be realized. You don't have to move away from your home. And I was speaking to young people today at that Darlington campus who were telling me about that. All from the Northeast, up from Newcastle, from York, from Durham, from Teesside, from North Yorkshire, all of them working at the heart of government in Darlington. All of them said to me, this is incredible. I never thought I'd be able to do this. I didn't want to move down to London. That's what this Conservative government has done for young people across the north, as well as all the improvements, which make sure that people can have pride. In right, so now we're back to, like, level zero. You destroyed the north. You took so much money out of their communities. You didn't bother doing anything until 2019 when Boris Johnson decided, well, maybe all of this North-South divide stuff is, isn't great for Conservative politics. And you're now hoping for praise for doing what you should have been doing ages ago. What should be normal governance? Thanks. Hi, Rishi. It's uh, Keith from Edinburgh. Uh, my question is about social care. Social care is chronically underfunded and government has abdicated responsibility to local government, effectively making it a postcode lottery for many. Do you agree that it needs radical reform? And if so, what? So social care is something that is a particular challenge for councils. And you're right, if you talk to most local council leaders, I'll talk to you about the challenges in social care. I think you all know we've got an ageing population that puts pressure on. And that's why just the other week we announced an extra £600 million for local government across the country. And it will mean that on average, this coming financial year, councils will have about 7.5% more money to invest in local services like social care than they did last year. So that gives you a sense of the scale and of that extra money that we... Okay, we've... so that's still 33% less than they had before, give or take. Because 40% council budgets have dropped in real terms since 2010. So that's a drop in the bucket considering how much you've cut away a local authority funding regime. Put in the bulk of it is ring fence specifically for social care because that's where the challenge is. Now, I don't have an overnight fix to the challenges in social care. Of course I don't. Right. But I do know that if we improve how social care works with hospitals, as I was talking about, it will make a difference. Because that's where there isn't enough join-up. 
And that's why we're, as I said, working hard. And it won't happen overnight because the NHS is a big system and social care are obviously spread across the country, lots of individual local authorities. But bit by bit, we're joining those things up closer together. And that's how I think we will bring real improvements uh, to bear. Because, of course, it's important, right? I believe in a country where if you work hard all your life, you should have dignity in retirement. And social care is part of that contract we have with our grandparents and those who have come before us. So it's important that we get it right. I can't promise you it's going to fix overnight, but I can tell you we've just put a lot of extra cash in to help councils with some of that pressure going into next year. It's weird how all of these problems, right, all of these problems with what's happening with the NHS, what's happening with social care, happening with dentistry, happening with the schools, happening with all of these different things. It's weird how the answer apparently to all of these questions after everything has just been put more money in. Right? We've promised more money for the NHS. We've promised more money for social care. We've promised more money for dentistry. Turns out, actually, all of these discussions about reforming the sector or the failures of the public sector or you know failures in certain modelling or certain provisions or efficiencies and too many people in administrative capacity who are being employed there, all of that was just a smokescreen for the fact that really and truly the answer was just putting in more money. Like, turns out the simplest answer was the correct one. Please. Hi, Rishi Sunak. I've got so much to say, but such little time. My name is John Watt, and I'm one of the COVID vaccine injured in this country. I want you to look at... Oh, God. They would have screened this question as well. Oh, GB News never change. Never change, GB News. In my eyes, Rishi Sunak, and I want you to look at the pain, the trauma, and the regret I have in my eyes. We have been left with no help at all. Not only am I in here that's vaccine injured, there's another man over there whose life's been ruined by that COVID-19 vaccine. I know people who have lost legs, amputations. I know people with heart conditions like myself, Rishi Sunak. Why have I had to set up a support group in Scotland to look after the people that have been affected by that COVID-19 vaccine? Why are the people who are in charge, who told us all to do the right thing, have left us all to rot? and left me and the thousands and the tens of thousands in this country to rot. Rishi Sunak looked me in the eye. When are you going to start to do the right thing? The vaccine damage payment scheme is not fit for purpose. In Scotland right now, according to the yellow card system, there are over 30,000 people that have had an adverse reaction to that vaccine. And okay, deaths. J John, thank you very much indeed for your question. It's you for you to start doing the right thing, yeah. Mr Rishi Sunak, and the rest. Why is he getting an applause for this? Like. I guess I'm not super like up on the very specifics about the NHS's response to the vaccine injured. If he is, does indeed have a vaccine injury, I'm sceptical. But we literally have an NHS for this reason. So if your answer is, if people have had adverse reactions to any kind of medicine, they should be treated by the NHS, which is screwed up because of the Conservative Party, then maybe you'd have an argument here. But what's his, what, was his even, what was his question? What was his point? What do you even have to say? Like, why, why are we setting up a support group? But yeah, the NHS doesn't have enough funding to deal with it. The NHS is low in capacity. What is he supposed to be just being mad about the fact that we were recommended to take a COVID vaccine? Because that wasn't even a question. It was just a, a rant. It was just a, an expletive. Just a long screed. Well, yeah, true. And also, you know, hundreds of thousands of people died from COVID, so... You've, you've made a really strong point, John. Prime Minister. Yeah, John, well, I'm very sorry to hear about... Hang on a minute. Whoa, whoa. He didn't interject. The GB News host didn't interject about good points in any of the other questions. Yeah, as soon as the weirdo person ranting about vaccine injuries, he's like, oh, excellent points, as if they're trying to spread these conspiracy things. After Neil Oliver said some real nonsense about kids getting turbo cancer from the vaccine, genuine thing that happened, which Ofcom says is fine apparently. Why are GB are GB News just trying to create a nation of conspiracy theorists? Because they would again, they would have screened this question. So unless this guy has just written down the other question and just said what he wanted to anyway, and GB News didn't know it was going to happen. They've, they've deliberately planned to ensure that a weirdo rant about vaccine injuries was included in their broadcasting here. About your personal circumstances, and you said someone over here also seems to have suffered by, the similar, by a similar thing. Now, obviously, I, I don't know about the individual situation 
that you're in. Silence, Russia. We're silenced well, on I don't... social media and everything. Okay. We are silenced. We are the most silenced people in this country. We're silenced right. in the press because my story in the press okay. I had to go right. to the government for comment but and they made them take all right. the stuff out. For, forgive, me, forgive me both. I know I'm happy. We, we, I'm we, no, no, no one... No one okay. John, no one, no one is saying... No one's oh, saying yeah, okay. No one's saying. Saying. It's chaotic. What the hell is going on? No, my wife I, successful I, career. And, sir, you raised some very valid points, I'm sure. What I've got to say is, though, we haven't got you on microphone and, as you know, we've got to get through this... I'm sure we can, we can raise your points with the Prime Minister at a later yeah. date. But in the meantime, Prime Minister, if you yeah, no, cover I'm, the issue... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very happy to. So, look, there is a vaccine compensation scheme that's in place, as you alluded to in the NHS. Obviously, everyone individually will work through their cases. It's difficult for me to comment on anyone's individual case. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. I'm very happy to go and look at the cases, and I'm sure you'll get them to the team here. I mean, I, I'm very saddened and shocked to hear that you've been silenced by anybody. That is surprising to me, so please do get your details to Stephen and the team, and I will happily take that away. Of course, you should better speak about your experience, what's happened to you, and as I said, we have a compensation scheme in place for that, and I'll make sure that we're working through that. Obviously, I think you'll appreciate it's hard for me to comment on your specific circumstances, just not knowing them and those things. Are... Forgive me, sir. We haven't got a microphone on this, so our viewers and listeners won't be able to... I think look, the, la the last thing I'd say is, uh, you know, we went through a pandemic, like everyone else, at the points when it came to the vaccine, those decisions were always taken on the basis of medical advice from our medical experts to tell us as politicians, who are obviously not doctors, about how best to roll out the vaccine, what was in the public health interest, the priority order, how that should be done, who should be eligible. That was something that the doctors recommended on, and that's something that we followed. Now, obviously, if there are individual circumstances which haven't worked out, then that's why we have the compensation scheme in place, and I'll make sure that we follow up on your cases. Okay, okay. I mean, that's actually not a terrible answer there. Given that there was no real question being asked, it was just, oh, you failed us, what are you going to say to us? When it was just like, yeah, we have a compensation scheme, we want to look at your case. It seems like a reasonable answer, really and truly, in the face of something that didn't really make any sense. Again, there wasn't a real question being asked. Prime Minister, thank you. Gents, both of you, do give us your details. We will get that to the Prime Minister, and as he said, he will, I'm sure, look at that for you. In the meantime, let's move on to another question, sir. Good evening, Prime Minister. My name's Jack. I'm 28. I'm from York. My question is, the Reform Party are surging in the polls. They're hitting a note with many disillusioned Conservative voters like myself. What are you going to do to convince traditional, con vote, traditional Conservative voters that their vote is still better off with you? Yeah, in one sense... We want 5% off all public budgets because that's the Reform Party platform chat. Don't know if anybody know this, but one of the Reform Party's key policies is reducing government spending of all government departments by 5%. Imagine 5% being taken off the NHS budget. That's gigantic amounts. It's potty because the Reform UK party haven't got a clue what they're doing. In one sense, I can completely appreciate your frustration. Right. And that's because it's been a tough couple of years. Right. When we go through the things that we've been through as a country, as I said, energy bills more than doubling, right? again, starting to come down, the economic strain that that's put on all your family budgets, the impact of COVID on backlogs, NHS, waiting for appointments, like all of those things are, are real things that will cause you and everyone else an enormous amount of frustration. And I can completely understand that. But I think fundamentally what you want and what I want are the same. Right? What I talked about at the beginning, the things that I'm focused on, like the values that are important to me, I think are things that we probably share. And all of you who clapped, I'd probably say the same thing. Right? I think actually we want the same things for our country. We share the same values, whether that's on controlling spending, cutting your taxes to ease the cost of living, making sure that we have strong borders and we tackle illegal migration. Right? These are things that we have in common. These are all things that we want. And what I'd say to you and everyone else is the next election is a straightforward choice. At the end of it, Either Keir Starmer or I am going to be Prime Minister, right? I mean, literally, this is exactly all of the arguments that you're getting from the Labour right types, the centrists, saying, well, I know that Keir Starmer hasn't done anything that you want and doesn't share your values and has a policy platform that you don't agree with, but you have to vote him because it's either for Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak. And you know, to be fair, at least Reform UK voters know that the Conservative Party doesn't represent any of their values. I mean... They pretend to, they pretend to, 
Because actually, most people in this country, even Reform UK voters, do want strong public services. It's a very, very small minority of voters in this country that just want all of these flogged off to the private sector and then run worse, because that's what's happened because of privatisation and private provision. I mean, even Reform UK know this, as Reform UK are running on a 50% energy nationalisation plan. Because they've realised that they can run on the fact that we'll eat foreigners own our stuff, which is bad. We should own it ourselves. Our own state should own this. But there's just not a platform for neoliberal politics anymore. Reform UK know this. But clearly, the Labour Party has missed the memo as they're following the same continuity neoliberal stuff that you're getting from the Tories. And the Tories are sitting there on an anti-immigration platform that they've carried for you know, decades and decades that they've consistently failed on. Yeah, of course, people are going to be voting for Reform UK. But of course, you know, part of the reason why we have a growing economy is because of immigration. So it's up to you whether you want to make that decision. As people, which people were more honest with our country about what controls in immigration would mean or what increases in immigration would mean. Because these are going to have o o economic consequences depending on which path we take. You know, people want low immigration and quality public services and they get neither under the Conservative Party. Don't know why they ever expected quality public service under the Conservative Party because they've never delivered that. But at least Reform UK voters know they can't get that from the Tories. And a vote for anyone who is not a Conservative candidate is simply a vote to put Keir Starmer into number 10. So the question for you and everyone else who clapped, I completely appreciate your frustration, is who do you want to see in government after the next election? Who do you think it's more likely to deliver on the things that you care about. You have to vote for us Reform UK people because if you don't, you're responsible for Keir Starmer and they don't take any shit. They're going to destroy the Conservative Party from the outside because they don't care. They are, they are beyond the first past the post bullying that the mainstream parties will do to try and make sure that you are forced to vote for something that you don't believe in. Well, it is amusing that Keir Starmer is so right-wing that even Reform UK voters don't really mind him being Prime Minister. I guess that's their electoral strategy, which, to be fair, seems to be paying off at least somewhat. All right, you talked about those traditional Conservative things, right? Controlling spending, cutting taxes, a strong economy, bringing more... People don't want controlled spending. It's crazy. They keep saying people want controlled spending, and it's just not true. Even Tory voters want more spending. And it's not even like a small majority, it's a gigantic majority. A super majority of Conservative voters, when polled by Lord Ashcroft, say that they want more spending. They don't care about tax cuts and they don't care about deficit reduction. They want more spending because our public services do not work. And that's your fault. It's just Reform UK voters, despite wanting these things, are also too stupid to realise that you don't get these things by cutting 5% from every government budget. It's... Mortgage rates and inflation and borrowing down, strong borders police on the streets, right? all those things that you care about, who's more likely to deliver them? Because it's certainly not Keir Starmer, right? Now, you are the ones who took all of the police off the streets. Now, I don't think that Labour are going to be able to deliver on all of these things. I've said so, so many times on the channel. But the idea that the Tories can point at the Labour Party, even under Keir Starmer, and say, well, we're the ones who can put more police on the streets. You call all of the police. You literally took tens of thousands of police off the streets in the run-up to 2015. Jeremy Corbyn could literally run on a platform. The man who is very, very anti-authoritarian law enforcement, Jeremy Corbyn could run on a pro-police recruitment platform because of just how much our police services had been decimated by austerity. What the hell is he trying to say? And then, of course, on top of that, Reform UK, how are they going to recruit these people when they want to cut 5% from the budget? Please. My name is John from Darlington. I'm retired. And I'm worried about the local council finances. They're in such a parlous state. So why not review the council tax system so that a bandee in Darlington no longer has to pay the same council tax as the uh, bandee in London, when a house in Darlington might be 150k and the same house in London would be 1.5 million? Right. So, council tax, local government funding, I mean, a little bit what we touched on before, right? Council tax and local government funding are all mixed together. So in all your local areas, the money that your council is going to spend is a mix of what they raise locally 
and what they get centrally from government. Now, ultimately, those individual decisions are for your local councils, right? They set their council tax levels, and that's not something that we do centrally at government. What we do is say, look, there's a, a limit to what we think they should put up your council taxes without asking you in a referendum. Right, so that's our involvement in the council tax system. But ultimately, it's your local councillors who are going to set those council taxes. And you know, what I'd say to you, a couple of things. First of all, just reiterating what I said previously, we've provided an extra £600 million for local councils. No, but the banding in terms of what kind of percentage it's going to be in terms of council tax, that's the system that needs to be reviewed. It is incredibly stupid that we have such a wild disparity in terms of council tax payments between the North and the South. Which means this year... And the thing is, is that the Conservative government literally tried to change this. Of all the people who actually tried to change this, it was George Osborne, the butcher himself, the man who I base my entire political history opposing, actually was the one who wanted to change the banding system so that people who have like mansions and stuff actually pay a proper amount of council tax as opposed to people who just live in normal semi-detached or terrace properties. And David Cameron blocked it because he thought it would be a mansion tax. This shows you the priority, conservative voters, of what your conservative party believes in. They don't care about anybody who lives in a normal house or in, a, in the normal real world in this country because they think it's more politically advantageous to them to ensure that you and your normal house you pay the same similar kind of council tax than people who live in mansions in stoke poges or in london or whatever it might be and they didn't want to change that david cameron the prime minister literally blocked us from changing that to ensure that people who live in massive fuck off muck mansions didn't have to pay too much council tax. And that's why your bills are high. They'll have about seven and a half percent, as I said, more to invest in local services than they did last year. Now, of course, that will vary by council, but on average. And, and last year they had something like nine percent more to invest in local services than the year before. All right. So that's been the last two years worth of increases in funding for local services. Now, I know again, Council budgets have dropped 40% since 2010, with a gigantic slashes of council tax budgets, of, count, of the local authority budgets even, so sorry. And on top of that, not just have the budgets gone down, but the rate that they're having to spend on obligatory services that they are obliged to by their local authority contracts with the government. These services they have to provide, the burden on these services is massively increased on things like social care because of an aging population and on things like temporary accommodation because of a housing crisis that your stupid fucking policies caused that your restrictions on house building caused that your quantitative easing into the pockets of rich people to inflate asset prices these are all your policies that have caused a housing crisis that have made councils have to spend even more money on temporary accommodation. And on top of that, you're saying, well, we've increased budgets by 7% when they're already 33% after that, still in the black compared to where they were, or in the red, rather, sorry, compared to where they were in 2010. This will not wash. You've destroyed local authorities deliberately. £15 billion. Pounds. Fire sale of council assets to pay for budget shortfalls that you deliberately caused to ensure that our... Parks, our youth centres, our libraries, our swimming pools were all sold off to your mates from the private equity sector. All these things were owned by you at home. You at home, you owned these things in your local authorities collectively with everybody else. Your local swimming pools and libraries and youth centres, right? You owned these things and because the Tories wanted their mates in the private equity sector to get access to these assets, they've stripped council budgets specifically so they'd be forced to sell these things off so they could palm it off to their mates and they could then get all of the gains from your local amenities. Swimming pools and libraries, chat. Swimming pools and libraries and youth centres, all in the hands of billionaire rich fuckers. Because that's who donates to the Conservative Party. That's who believes in the this neoliberal, no role for the state ideology. And so there can be no use, societal utility for your library anymore. And that's the real world consequence of this massive slashing of council budgets. And he's saying, oh, we're going to come in and we're going to give them 7% extra. It's nothing, mate. It's nothing. It's papering over a gigantic, not just cracks, a gigantic gaping chasm that your government caused, that your government deliberately engineered for the last 14 years.
I'm so, it doesn't wash. It doesn't wash with me. Otherwise, you've done something before people started reporting it in the news. Because it's actually advantageous to you to talk on it about, about it now it's in the news. Whereas when it wasn't being reported, but all of us on this side were saying that it was terrible, it just got completely laid by the wayside in terms of national politics in this country. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh. I'm a student from Shrewsbury, uh, and I'm 19. Uh, the UK is estimated to be short of over a million homes. But despite this, your party have scrapped the house building target and you've scrapped Michael Gove's proposed planning reforms that would have liberalised uh, the building of houses. You say you have a plan, Rishi. Do you have a plan to fix the supply crisis in British housing? Yeah, so first of all, you said you're 19, Josh, is that right? Right, so look, I, I want you, I'm assuming you don't own your own home at the moment. No, I want you to experience what I experienced and what probably most of us, if I look around the room, have experienced at, at one point, and that is getting the keys to your first home. Right. I mean, it's an incredibly special feeling. Those of us who experience it, remember it, right? We start in a flat and hopefully build up over time, create a family there, build a life there. It's a magical, wonderful thing. And when I think about the type of country that I want to build as prime minister, it's one where aspiration and ambition are celebrated. And aspiration is about owning your own home, right? So look, I think it's really important that we make sure that you and everyone of your generation can do that. Now, look, I'm going to be honest, I don't have an overnight fix. It's become trickier, particularly in the southeast, right? And it varies by... The thing is, what's super easy, right, is using this government department that you have, it's called Homes England, that can create new social housing and build it using government money whenever you want. That's a quick fix. Super simple. It's, it already, you have to create a new department. It literally already exists. It's called Homes England. But you don't want to do that to you because you don't want to spend any money. And you don't like things being controlled by the public purse rather than being done for the benefit of the private sector. Yeah, but then poor people would get them. It's true, and then you'd be undermining landlordism, which is basically the Conservatives' entire voter base. I by region, actually. Funnily enough, again, I was talking to some people in the office in Darlington today, and they had just bought their first home, and they were in their late 20s, right? And, you know, so it does vary where you are. Um, but what can we do? Well, we need to build more homes, and that's what we're doing. So in this parliament, we talked about a million homes. You said we are going to deliver a million homes in this parliament. We said we were going to deliver a million homes. This parliament, we are on track to deliver a million homes in this parliament. So yes, the plan is working, right? We're also making it easier to get on the housing ladder. So stamp duty, you know, that's when you're trying to buy that first home, that stamp duty was a real problem. But now we've cut stamp duty for first time buyers. You probably won't know this, but something like 85% so we're going to add even more liquidity into the property market, making them even more expensive. And a first-time buyers right now don't pay any stamp duty when they buy their first home. So it saves them thousands of pounds. That's the tax cut that we introduced. And so all that does is help middle-class people get onto the housing ladder. It doesn't help people who are stuck renting, who need social housing. And most recently, though, we wanted to go further. There are these old EU rules called nutrient neutrality. I won't get into the, the details. Hey, Ben Sharp called it in chat. Of course, he's going to go to the Neutrality Act that Labour blocked. Because that's more important than all of these years where they could have been building council houses and haven't been. These legacy rules from the EU, they're defective. They don't actually do anything to help the environment, but they are blocking 100,000 homes from being very quickly delivered across the country. Now, we were going to pass a law to change that and protect the environment, and that would have very quickly unlocked 100,000 homes for you and people of your generation. What did the Labour Party do in the House of Lords? They blocked it, right? And this is what I talk about. And I talk about Keir Starmer, and I say he doesn't have a plan, doesn't have principles. This is a guy who's saying, oh, yes, we've changed. We want to build homes, all the rest of it. But there was an opportunity. We put a law down in the House of Lords to change this defective EU law that we've inherited that's blocking 100,000 homes. And what do they do? They blocked it, right? So, look, do I know we've got more to do? Of course we do, because it is too hard. I'd love it to be easier, right? But we are making progress. We are building the homes, and we will keep going. And actually, we'll be making some more announcements about that this week. And you may have seen a little bit about that over the weekend from Michael, making it easier to build in certain places where we do need to do homes, but do that in a way that brings everyone with us. But there was an opportunity for Keir Starmer to do the right thing and make it easier for you and your generation to have those 100,000. But also to have worse rivers as well. Again, so all this did was change the burden of dealing with the after effects of pollution. Take that from developers and put the burden onto local authorities instead. So you're spending the money either way.
But of course, you know, if you had like a public developer, for example, right, if you had a public developer, say, who could not be constrained by not wanting to fall foul of environmental regulations, they who because they would be more expensive for them to have to take that into account when the burden is on them. You could have a state developer that did that, that owned the housing to do it. And there wouldn't be private developers being put off by not destroying the environment with the things that they build. You could do that. But that would involve poor people getting the housing, which is not what we don't want in the Conservative Party. Thousand homes, and he said no. So we're going to keep letting go because I want you to feel what I feel and what many of us did because it's a very special thing. And that but then he keeps saying, "Well, we'll be about two million homes or whatever it is," and they've just massively missed their target every single year since two thousand and ten. And even their own MPs want to block housing targets, like Theresa Villiers. I mean, loads of them vote for the Villiers Amendment. Thanks, Prime Minister. My name's Daniel. I'm assistant head of an independent school on Seaside. Independent schools in regions such as the North East are not the Eatons of this world. And one of Labour's few remaining policies is to charge VA. Mm, independent. They keep saying independent rather than a private now. Hmm, I wonder why they keep doing that. I wonder why they change the verbiage so much, chat on independent school fees. Now, many of our families are middle-income families that make um, lifestyle compromises to be able to invest in their children's education. Any rise in fees would be very difficult for them to manage, uh, meaning their children would likely end up back in a swamped state. So there's no... Nothing is forcing you as somebody who works in a private school from passing those costs on to the people who send your send kids to your school there's nothing forcing you to pass those costs on from your private schools you could absorb those costs if you wanted so that those people could actually still have the excellent education for their children that you say that you provide you could keep those costs the same and take on the burden of those tax rises yourself i wonder why they don't do you think they're operating on a shoestring budget and there's the minimum price possible that they could be charging parents for private schools? Do you think that's the case? Is it razor thin margin they're operating on? I wonder. Sector, um, what are your plans for education and why are you not doing more to call out a policy that is at best ideological grandstanding, but at worst fiscally irresponsible and playing politics with the education of young people? I mean, none of those things are true. None of the, this is the, definitely a policy that I absolutely support from the Labour Party, but it's ideologically reasonable to make sure that we don't just let people get away with having a charity that's also profit generating, because that's not how charities are supposed to work. And second of all, it's not fiscally responsible because you'll just make those taxes back elsewhere if people leave and send their kids elsewhere. And it's, you can also take the revenue from that and put it into the public school system. Oh, very well said, Daniel. <laughs> we'll put you in front of a TV camera and yeah, solve that problem. Um, yeah, so what, what are we doing on education? Look, I, I got into politics partly because of education, right? I, I think education is the most powerful thing that you can do to transform people's lives. I often say that there isn't a silver bullet in my job in public policy, but the closest thing, although we have to a silver bullet, is education. If we can create a world-class education system in this country, that is the best way to transform young people's lives. And we are making progress. When I say the plan is working, by God, is it working in education, thanks to the reform. We literally had schools closing on day one of first day of term in September because they might have collapsed because you, you very specifically, cut funding to rebuild schools that had out-of-date expired aerated concrete in them literal jumbly crumbly concrete in our schools because you cut the funding you specifically not the conservative party although they did cut the funding when there was a rebuilding schools program the brown promised in 2010 but rishi sunak specifically as chancellor reduced our capital expenditure on ensuring the structural soundness of our schools and rebuilding our schools you did that rishi and now he's Prime Minister saying that they've achieved so many great things on education when they are the ones who cut the funding so that schools might potentially collapse on children's heads. 
<laughs> well, you know what, actually? So I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I don't know how much right. time we've got left. I am genuinely surprised we've not had any questions about oh, the economy, the cost of living. Right, so that, I'm just genuinely puzzled by All that. All right, here we go. So that well, would be the first time might, I've ever done one of don't you find it weird? Don't you find it strange, chat? How there wasn't any questions about the cost of living in the GB News audience. Might that say something about the demographics of people who would apply to be in the audience for GB News? That they don't feel concerned over potential cost of living issues. I mean, Rishi Sunak does say that he's surprised, but I think it might say something about the kind of clientele who would apply to be in a GB News audience, that their main concern is not indeed the economy and cost of living, which is, when you look at every single YouGov poll on this issue, is overwhelmingly the biggest issue facing people in this country outside of NHS waiting lists. Those are the two main ones. It depends on which group that you go to. Most groups will say their biggest concern is the cost of living. And the GB News audience... All of them who applaud the idea of voting, voting for Reform UK, none of these people are having issues with the cost of living crisis, apparently. Hmm. Hmm. Just a thought, just, a, just an interesting thing for you to ponder. Hey there, if you enjoyed the video, make sure that you like and leave a comment that helps the video out in the algorithm. If you subscribe and ring the bell, it'll let you know when I go live. I stream every day on YouTube and Twitch. You can also follow all of my socials down in the description. And if you want to support me in a more financial manner, there's a join button for memberships. It's just 99p to be a member on YouTube, as well as a patron. And there's some merch there as well. And hopefully I'll catch you on the next video. Take care.